Hello you, it's me. Today we're going to talk about Prey by Graham Masterton. This book is a horror novel and it's very much a Lovecraft mythos book. I didn't actually know that going in, but since I've read Lovecraft before, there wasn't stuff that was lost on me that may be lost on people who haven't. So a man whose wife has just left him moves to the Isle of Wight in the UK uh, to renovate an orphanage called 40 Foot House for a client. While staying there, he becomes aware of something living in the house with him. The villagers all seem to know the name of the thing living in the house, Brown Jenkins, a name which all the Lovecraft fan fans will know, which he sets out to find and catch, or at least prove the existence of. He finds out the house is subject to space and time anomalies, and with a new love interest, rat catcher, vicar, and local detective, sets out to find what's going on and becomes involved in a plot involving magic, witchcraft, time travel, elder gods. It's a lot of idea crammed into one book, and it's definitely a ride. I'll do all the non-spoilery bits first, and uh, spoiler bits come at the end, but I'll warn you when they're coming. If you handed me this book with a cover ripped off, I feel like I would have had a completely different experience. The title is misleading, and paired with the image on the cover, it's Steve Coogan, <laughs> which is misleading, is kind of double misleading. It really leads you into thinking that this story is going to go a certain way and the way it actually went was very unexpected. While this cover has a nice retro feel, it's completely the wrong choice for the story. Style, yes, very cool. Subject matter, mm, nah. The author clearly has a good handle on creating atmosphere and tension with a really classic feel. It's an expansion of the Lovecraft mythos work, draws on a lot of themes from Lovecraft and is clearly a follow-up to a Lovecraft story which I think is called Dreams in the Witch House. The first third of the book, the story with the unease that's used, felt like something that could fit very snugly into the Lovecraft universe. But it sort of lost its way for the last two thirds. This is mainly because while the author has his strengths, characters are where he falls down and they're so unrealistic that they actually feel quite silly. And I think it really prevented me from getting invested in what was actually going on because I was mad at the people that things were happening to. And the absolutely ridiculous, ridiculous sex scenes didn't help either. So from here on, it's spoilers. Uh, so the first thing I'd like to touch on is the people in the book. The whole book and the premise of the main character's uh, company he kept felt like a middle-aged, midlife crisis dad fantasy. His wife leaves him, he goes to live in a big house on the Isle of Wight, on pretty much his first night there, a 19-year-old girl, this guy's like 35, 40 by the way, a 19-year-old girl who's way hotter than his wife, moves in. She's super into him uh, and agrees to stay in the house with him on the premise that she'll cook for him. He immediately describes her boobs as large for her size and his ex-wife's as gnat bites, which is cool, what a cool and nice guy. So they get with each other almost immediately, uh, and he just straight up trusts her to look after his son. The son is instantly enamoured with this girl, doesn't really miss the mum very much, asks her questions like, Do you love my daddy? It all seems super cringy, and it feels like a situation dreamed up by somebody who's probably very sad. The love interest, Liz, is almost as weirdly written as the main character, constantly telling him again and again, I need a man who can make a decision but that seems super irrelevant to any of the things that are actually happening. She's instantly trusting of this strange older man in a creepy abandoned house. The sex scenes again, they're horrific, and one of the best worst lines I've ever read actually popped up in the book, which was, Her tongue searched between my teeth like a warm porpoise. So all this stuff starts happening to the main characters, he sees this humanoid rat creature, Brown Jenkins, and continues to sleep in the building with the lights off. A rat catcher in the house has his face ripped off and he stays in the house. A local vicar is killed in the house and hidden under the floorboards. He has to dig him out the floorboards, drag him through the village in the dead of night, dump him in the sea, and he stays in the house. This guy has a million and one opportunities to walk away before this whole thing spirals out of control. And he's just like, mm, nah, think I'll stay. And Liz decides that she's going to stay in this random scary house that people are dying in with the random man that she doesn't know. So clearly she's thick as porridge too. With the deaths though, one thing I did like about this book was that it's surprisingly gory. 
Uh, the style of the book feels very James Herbert, but with Simon Clark gore on top, which is a really good combo. Also, I'm not sure how the police weren't instantly swarming this guy and accusing him of, like, triple murder. Also, his decision to stay at the house again and again with his son, even after his son saw a bloated, drowned corpse in a rock pool on the beach. Andy keeps leaving this his son with this woman that neither of them really know. All of those things really clash with what he says about being uh, devoted to his son, loving his son, and concerned for his son's safety. Besides the main character, there were a cast of other characters in the village that all seemed to be writer's conveniences to info dump. He meets the rat catcher whose brother was taken by Brown Jenkin, the rat catcher's wife who tells him all about Brown Jenkin, the cafe owner who tells him about Mr. Billings, the previous owner of the orphanage who made a bargain with one of the spirits that lived there. He meets the local vicar with a keen interest in the paranormal who comes round to help him investigate and a detective who tells him about the missing children over the years associated with 40 Foot House and who completely instantly believes in spirits and ghosts and demons. It just seemed like coincidence after coincidence. And I know it's a cheesy horror book, but it was a lot and we were just spoon fed information again and again. When the book talked about the origins of one of the main antagonists, and it built the picture of the things in the sewer in London where they had come from, the way the creature was served and displayed in almost a shrine-like manner was one of my favourite parts of the book, and I wish it had been expanded on through flashbacks. I feel like the picture it painted there would have made an incredible cover art focus, and the way that that same scene of the character's origins was parodied right at the end was really good. While the ending ending of this book was really a lot better than sort of the wacky build up to it, I feel like this book tried to rewrite a lot of aspects of the Lovecraft mythos, with the three main groups of Elder God being born from human blood, human spit, human seed, being dependent on humans for their genesis, but then predating humans, and the weird human dependency of these gods made them feel way less horror, eldritch, cosmic. And I know this is like a Dreams in the Witch House sequel, but the character mentions Lovecraft by name. So is this implying that he's figuring out that all Lovecraft stories were true? It was kind of weird. Like, if he knew Lovecraft, which he clearly did, and he'd read Lovecraft, which he clearly had, surely he'd know the name Brown Jenkins. The book starts off with a good premise, has a lot of potential. Uh, yeah, it's a very cool horror aesthetic book to read. Gory, cosmic horror-y, uh, good atmosphere building, but unfortunately it just got so messy towards the end. There was a weird deus ex machina uh, good spirit that appeared within the last 50 pages purely to info dump that hadn't been alluded to at all. And it mentions this other guy once early in the book who's not involved in the story at all, turns up in the last scene, doesn't do anything, but it turns out that he's actually Satan. And then the detective who's been on the main character's side for the whole book. There's a scene right at the end where Mr. Billings, who'd made a pact with one of the Elder Gods, is about to become a vessel for them and receive their blessing. And the good guy detective just shoves this guy out of the way and he's like, No, me! I was like, what? Where was the motivation for that? What the hell's going on? Listen, I, even though I have all those criticisms, I did really like this book. It was a lot of fun to read. But god damn, it was a mess. So even though I liked it, I'm going to give it two stars because that's really all it deserves. So thank you for watching this one, this review. Um, don't forget to like, comment, and, sub and, sub and subscribe. Uh, what's the best horror you've read this year so far? Tell me down in the comments. Uh, follow me on Twitter. I'll put the link for that down there as well. Uh, thanks for watching. See you soon.